Uh, considering the seriousness and the depth of everything we've been talking about today, there's a, uh, there's a height mod version two that I learned about, uh, thanks to one of our contributors. And I'll read it to you. While at a surveyor seminar recently, a lively discussion ensued among two surveyors about recent changes to the geoid model in South Louisiana. What kind of elevation differences have you observed in the new model, asked Mark. Well, Ken replied, well, I performed a GPS observation on an old NGS benchmark in front of my office using the new geoid model. And would you believe the post-process elevation moved up two tenths of a foot? Up two tenths, that's strange. I thought we were subsiding, Mark said. Me too, said Ken, but I fixed that problem. What'd you do, said Mark? Well, I beat that brass cap down with correct elevation from old sledgehammer. <laughs> Wouldn't you know that sitting in front of the two surveyors, listening was the NGS advisory. His head was in his hands. Uh, we thank Ricky for that anecdote. <laughs> uh, Rick, Ricky John, Ricardo Johnson is a, uh, uh, has been working for some time with John Chance and Associates, or John Chance Land Surveying, and uh, uh, he's going to contribute some of his experience, I hope. Dave Newcomer has been referenced several times today by speakers, and he's with, the, uh, with NGS NOAA and uh, uh, is a, a trainer for the uh, G, uh, for the, whew, I'm losing my speech. Uh, a trainer for the Opus uh, projects, and uh, a fellow who gives you lots of good advice. He's given over 150 workshops in terrestrial land, terrestrial and GPS land surveying. Uh, let's see. Yeah, sitting next to him is Stan Ard. Now Stan works for our LOD, uh, the Louisiana DOTD from St. Francisville, and uh, his avocations are hunting and fishing, and uh, much of his expertise has to do with the topographic survey projects and such that he's uh, in charge of for, uh, for the DOTD. Clifford Mounier spoke to you uh, earlier this morning, and most of us in this room have uh, uh, experienced his explanations of things. His publications, in case you haven't noticed them, are monthly, almost. is it monthly? In the grids and datums column of the uh, Remote Sensing and Photogrammetry Magazine, journal. And he's a professor, uh, one of the professors here at uh, LSU in, in the Civil Engin Environmental Engineering. And by no particular reason, the last person introduced is Stephen Stopanol, our great storyteller. Uh, Steve's been surveying and following the footsteps of his uh, paternal relatives for some years originally from St. Bernard Parish and chased out by some lady whose name begins with a K uh, and now lives halfway between New Orleans and Baton Rouge. Uh, Steve has proven his worth as a storyteller. He's got several novels to his uh, credit, as well as uh, uh, we could go on for a long time talking about some of the stories of survey projects he's done. This is your panel. My name is Tony, Tony Cavell. I've been and I'm still and again with a, a C4G at LSU and uh, done lots of other cool things in the trade that keep you excited about surveying. The purpose is to get, is to, is to dig into your curiosity now and hopefully gain some insight of how improvements in the advice that's been given today as well as uh, things that need to be uh, research, perhaps, because they weren't covered well enough, or because you still have a curiosity, or because we didn't explain them well enough. So is there anyone brave enough to be the first one to raise his hand and ask it? Because everyone has one. I heard a voice. Behind me. Yes, sir. I got a lot of questions. Well, ask me a question. Okay. Uh, Act 194, the NAVD 88, um, there's the... Uh, statute that was passed uh, in the state uh, in this, for the state of Louisiana for determining elevation. I don't remember statute numbers, but I uh, remember the Act. 194 is what it's mm -hmm. labeled. Okay. It was signed by the governor, I believe. And uh, when was that? 2000? Would have been about six, seven years ago. Yeah. So 
when you when you say NAVD88, what flavor of NAVD88 is that? Because we have different flavors of NAVD88. To me, it that leaves us open there. Because if I do, if I if I'm using a GP or if I'm using an elevation on a benchmark, it could have three or four different elevations on it. But the latest one is supposed to be the most current. Is supposed to be the most valid. So. I have an answer, but you're on the panel. Okay. <laughs> well, that's a question I've got. Uh, any volunteers on the panel? Yes, the latest step up. Yeah, the EPIC doesn't change the NAVD88. You have to use the most recent EPIC. The EPIC that's in force now, when you do the observation, it's EPIC you use. The understanding I got from NGS some years ago was that, NA, uh, that the NAVD88, actually, I guess this applies definitely 1080D83, but I think it is relative to NAD, NAVD88 as well, is that the definition of the datum is perfect. It's the realization of the datum that gets improved. So by just calling for 88, you're asking for the, the closest you can get to the truth in that datum. So it would be, it would be incorrect to take an observation today and run an EPIC from 2004. Without appropriate transformations, yeah, I would think so. I don't even like doing it with the transformation. Well, yeah, of course. Yes, sir. I, and I guess my question might kind of correlate with the previous question is, is uh, so much of these elevations are being um, compared to uh, uh, FEMA, FEMA flood mapping. Yes. Uh, researching uh, a lot of the work that was done with the flood mapping, it uh, requires you to do transformations uh, to compare elevations over time. And uh, although we want to do the most up to date efforts, I don't think that you can often use that information with that older flood data. The question is, and I'll try to respace. <laughs> What, what are their comments in, in trying to come up with those uh, transformations? I'm going to rephrase it mainly for the broadcast, and that's the question is how do we uh, justify our most recent uh, realization of, of a datum w when the map that we're trying to talk about was used in an older one? And does anybody have comments to that regard? What you're supposed to do is to use the latest available information and the latest epoch. And what you're supposed to do on the FEMA form is to state that, mm -hmm. and then if you wish to use some uh, antique transformation that is invalid, like, like VertCon, you can do that, but state what you did on the same FEMA form. So that, so that you have a chance of, of getting closer to the, the epoch and datum that's on, on the uh, flood map itself. And, and remember, these flood maps were made at a certain time, and they're valid for the instant they were made, and they become increasingly obsolete as you get away from that period in time. You can't go back and observe today a condition that might have been 10, 15 years ago. This, it's not possible because we don't have time travel. The only thing that we can do is, I think, as surveyors, is observe what we have today based upon the most recent geoid and say, this is what we got. Now, some bureaucrat somewhere might say, well, you know, you have to translate it into the old datum. Okay, lie to them and use work time. But it's not a real translation. It is imaginary. Uh, a practice and illusion. I had an explanation. But just state with what, state, state what you state did. All the that's, that's the most important part. I had an explanation from, because I was giving one of the engineers for FEMA a hard time about this, and his uh, explanation to me was, don't consider, because I said, NGS has told us they can't tell us where 29 is anymore. How can I give that? And he said, after going back and talking to his superiors and coming back, said, don't think of it as an elevation. When you're putting this old number in, it's just a number, it's a rating number 
that you have to put in because that's the, the, those are the numbers that the insurance agent has on his chart. If you give him something else, he can't do the rating. So use this government publication, VertCon, <laughs> to transfer from the truth, which is your realization of 88, to put it into the number that will be used by the, just uh, to, if it, in talking to me, he said, and if it makes you feel better, stop thinking of it as an ovation. It's just a number that the insurance guys need. The most important thing that I've heard every time that I've done anything with the FEMA is use, overuse, and reuse the comments page. If you say enough in the comments, they will be able to take what you've done and make sense of it. That's, that is their most, it's the most repeated advice that I get from them. You can't take too many pictures with good descriptions and you can't put enough explanation if you explain it well enough and they say, oh, well, you know, you really should have done this, they have the ability to see that. And if you, by the explanation, and say, oh, I see what he did, then they're home free, both. To give you, to give you an example of the level of understanding that FEMA and the flood raiders have, I can go back to, oh, I guess 15, 20 years ago when we were having so much trouble with non-conformity of vertical data in the New Orleans area. We had a big meeting, and I, you might have been there, Cliff. Uh, we had a big meeting, and they had all the uh, surveyors in the metropolitan area, along with all the uh, flood zone administrators and uh, planning officials. And FEMA was there to explain to us how we were going to take care of this problem we were having with non-conforming vertical data. Benchmarks wouldn't agree with one another. This is the official answer FEMA gave us. This is the published official rule. You can use a benchmark to obtain an elevation if the benchmark is within six inches of the truth. And that was their solution. <laughs> That's why they call them benchmarks. But, but once you had the benchmark within six inches of the truth, the elevation that you ran to the structure and back had to be corrected within one hundredth of a foot. That was the official answer from FEMA. And then, and then the uh, base point elevation is the nearest end. Doesn't matter. That's, and then, no, that's new. Uh, there's a related question on one of the, uh, uh, we had received some questions from you ahead of the seminar, and uh, one, one uh, fellow asked, are all of Louisiana's flood maps on the same datum? No. And uh, we, not only are they not, we knew that, but how many? And uh, about half the pictures. Well, uh, somewhere, somewhere in the neighborhood of half or a little more, are uh, we were in the 30s, and we have 64 parishes were updated. So it's. Uh, and this is a this is a very hairy topic. I mean, it'd be awesome to get somebody from FEMA and grill them on that. Yeah. I've been a part of some of the fields of flood maps in the past. Uh, a lot of times what they do in these new flood studies is they'll take an old 29 flood study and just convert it 700s or whatever the average is at the time, which is BS. They don't take into account, uh, you know, the, all this gravitational like these new, new geoids are, uh, subsidence. Uh, and this is going to be a big big topic coming up, especially for Alexander. Bill was showing earlier the 14B geoid comparing to 12A. And I don't know if y'all, a lot of y'all noticed, you know, in Alexandria, Three quarters of a foot difference. Somebody's been a subdivision right now based flood. It's gonna be hard to explain to them a year and a half from now that their house is three quarters of a foot of flood, you know. Uh, and that's our job. And, and we're the usually on the front line of that, taking the brunt of that. Uh, it's not the FEMA guy, it's the surveyor that's having to answer those questions and explain to them why their house is three quarters of a foot difference uh, three years after you shoot it, just because of new chill. That's a lot considering the amount of time that we have to dedicate to FEMA. But you're in charge. If there's more FEMA questions, let me know. Uh, we've had a lot of talk about the use of VRS and geoids. Otherwise, a question, John? We were talking about the geoids. 14B and compared to 12A, it's about 15 feet of Exactly what that change, what you particularly be when, it, when that gravity model comes into play and 
GEOID 12A, uh, and I should have been clear with this, I apologize. But what you saw on that graphic was the difference between two different GEOID models from two different surfaces. So GEOID 12A was from NAVD 880, if you will. GEOID 14B is from a different geopotential surface, a global gravimetric surface. We really won't see that, that big difference. No. Okay. The, the idea was to show you that the, the differences between the two of them should have been more uniform, or at least we could see a trend going across Louisiana between the two of them. One was from a gravity surface, one was from NAVD 88, which is biased to that surface but it's, it has a little bit of tilt, slope to it, because of the difference in the, the geo center of NAD83 and, and all that stuff. And it's biased by half a meter, too. So the, diff, the, the idea was, yeah, this, we can't use 14B just by itself for NAVD88 elevations. I mean, it'll give you that, but all it do, it's doing is just changing it to match GOE 12A is what it's doing. So, we can use it, though, as a better surface than, than the GEOID for GEOID 12A and figure out how to produce an NAVD88 from it. And the idea was to show you those differences across Louisiana, or at least most of Louisiana, just to say GEOID 12A doesn't look consistent with the newest GEOID that they have out, 14B. Would it doesn't some of the have a, a slope, a, a trend that we can see. It bounces around. Would some of those differences that your subtraction showed be a result of the fact you had two different ellipsoids underneath them yes. and the matching? Yes, so it's but not you all be able just to see the like the other graphic that showed the nice smooth right. differences. There wasn't that; it was bouncing around. So because of that, I would put more faith in, in a, the surface that has just been recently developed with the aero gravity mm -hmm. and using grav D along the golf course. So I think if I understand right, you're saying that the shape that's represented by the newer geoid is probably more correct. Yes. But for official purposes more right now, surface, the, NAVD88 is, is what it is. If we can go from that surface to NAVD88, I think we're going to get a better answer than just using... And that's why they, in 22, they're going to... Yes. So that's the motivation. That's, that'll be the basis. But it, so it's not anything for heartburn right now for you, for instance, and where John is in Alexandria, to worry about no. that distance. No. But okay. understand that maybe we can come up with a better answer, maybe. Okay. Using it. So, so let me I'm gonna ask a follow up question along his. I, I don't think I'm, I got a big voice there. Tony. Go ahead anyway. The, uh, let's move ahead, let's move forward in our time machine to 2022. Okay, and we have a new national vertical data uh, based upon a gravimetric geoid that has a tremendous amount of airborne gravity data. So we think we have a better, higher resolution model. Yep, time. So my, my, my question is two prone. One, are the firms going to be updated at that point? Because that impacts all of us in here, even though we're in the surveying profession, we're, most of us live in Louisiana and own property here, have to buy flood insurance, pay for it. Um, and will the, how will we keep up with the altimetric heights from that day moving forward? Yeah. What's our idea in terms of a program to, to do a better job than we're doing today? Because obviously we don't know where we're at today yeah. from an elevation perspective, altimetric height perspective. The, the second part of that question is good because we will know where we are. Uh, by one setup with GNSS, we'll know within a couple centimeters of the national vertical data where we are anytime. The bad news is we're relying on FEMA to update their maps. Now, if what I'm hearing is correct. We're saying that FEMA is still using NGVD 29. And about half of our maps, yes. Places. So they haven't even updated the NAVD 88. They need to be updating the flood study. Which is how long has NAVD 88 been in? Okay. Oh, yes. Some of them use it, I think. It's about half, a little more correct? than half. That's correct. Bill, I guess, I guess a point of my question is this, right? This is a fantastic 
That's too much trouble. Yeah. Based upon this route and right? yeah. you could have a better bridge to go from our ability to measure it. That's all quite very accurate if you all can measure my data. Okay? So if you can't kind of pull everybody else along to get there, I mean, we're, we're on this mission. We can get past this mission set to get done by 2022. Unless you get the other facets that fit into the puzzle properly, we yep. need the same structure. I agree 100%. To get to there um, NGS has been banging the drum for years now about this new data. It's going to require a lot of states in the country to change their annotated code because they call for a particular geometric datum, they call for a particular vertical datum. If they just said at the current datum as defined by the National Genetic Survey, everything would be fine. But there's a lot of annotated code that says NAD83 and NAVD88. They have to be changed. Uh, and the NGS has been banging the drum for that for some time. Yes, it's going to be a wonderful thing, but, you know, if you can't get everybody on the same page with it, you're, you're creating some chaos. It's not so, only going to be the states either. It's going to be local governments are going to have the same problem. Yeah, well, I've what? seen local governments where the datum is mean sea level. Yeah, so it's it's a bigger it's a bigger political problem. Oh yes, than it is anything else. Yep. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> but I came knowing that that would be the case. I just wanted to have a greater appreciation for what this is. I work with Maurice, and he's always talking about this stuff. I apologize. You have to you have to talk at a certain level. I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Here's my thing. I work a lot with the flood insurance rate maps educationally and with the Ag Center. Um, there's a certain use of those maps for insurance that we really can't do anything about. But they are also used by very people to create construction and, and improvement. Um, if we take the ones who really are interested in using that information to protect yourself, is there anything your community can do that's been in practice that I'm talking about and do to help Louisiana do the best we can with what we've got? Can we, is there a way to take a, um, a base flood elevation from place to but the main problem with that is is the world won't sit still the damn thing keeps moving and because it keeps moving that that FEMA map from 20 years ago presents information that was probably stale 20 years ago that's absolutely obsolete now. And I don't know of a way to massage something that wasn't right 20 years ago to make it right today. There's no quick and easy answer for it. Um, if municipalities had the foresight, they could run some of their own hydraulic studies and develop a flood zone uh, uh, analysis based upon today and then with some good modern work, kind of keep that up, especially keeping track of developments. Uh, depending upon the quality of the FEMA map you have, um, you might be able to do some of that kind of massaging to, to kind of get a feel for it. It's really, the maps were created to develop flood insurance rates for the purpose of having subsidized federal flood insurance. And to use those maps for something other than what they were developed for <coughs> is to misuse the map. So as far as it comes for community planning, it's better than nothing to say, well, you've got to be above this certain FEMA elevation. But you, it, it's, it's hard to explain that that elevation is no longer valid. I don't know how to inexpensively de 
develop a good understanding of the flood hazard or the flood risk for a certain particular area without having modern and up-to-date information about it. I don't know how to take an old map and generate new information from that old map. I don't have that ability. Some of what I think... To add insult to injury, some of the new maps, well, all of the new maps were developed from analyses done from LIDAR surveys. This was the dawn of LIDAR technology. And as a result, it turns out that the majority of the new LIDAR maps were done wrong. They're not correct and they have no relationship to reality in terms of elevation. They have the texture of the surface, but the surfaces are tilted and warped because of using improper old stale benchmarks for control because the LIDAR surveying and mapping was done too soon into the dawn of the new technology and the, the, the new GPS leveling that was done in the state after Katrina, well, it was done before Katrina and as a result, it's incorrect and any uh, community planning based on those uh, could be seriously an error. Sounds like most of the answers. Didn't, didn't we cheer you up a lot? Yeah, that's what I was about to. <laughs> most of the answers have been negative, but. I can't take an old map and get new data out of it. Okay. Could you make uh, some sort of a transport? Some sort of a study that says if we keep doing what we can do in the field, we're on the map, which is using the regular instructions. We're digging a hole this big. We need to do, we need to invest in better mapping, better data now, or we're not going to be able to afford what we got because we didn't follow that. Study that comes up with a number that makes it work. Oh, yeah, they, those kind of studies are there and available, and, and, uh, and, and local communities can do them. You know, it just, it's just that the FEMA was developed for one purpose, and we're purpose only, and to take that FEMA map and then use it for another purpose is, is a mistake. It's an inappropriate use of the map. I think some of the mistake, if you, as you describe it, is also caused by FEMA's incentives to the communities, which... Uh, you say that that map means that is the minimum right. standard for rate of right. development if you want to be able to get funded. But they provide incentives. They provide incentives to the communities in, I forget what, community credits, I think they're called. And if you have so many brownie points, the insurance rates for everybody in the community are improved. And there are all sorts of things like adding extra free board above what the minimum requirement Never is. Bad idea. Those sort of things. I suspect if someone investigated it and if it's not on the books, asked, if we invested in a new study, how many community credits would you give us sort of thing might be a path to follow. But uh, that's only, you'd only learn the answer to that after investigating. By Tony, you may find out an ugly truth. Yeah, well, that too. I, I'm trying to end on a little bit of a happier note. How's that? A big, a big I, difference wait. with all... A big, wait, 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 one second. Wait. A big difference with all of this is the majority of the country, for each individual county, they have significant differences in relief. And a small amount of error is immaterial. In Louisiana, we're like a billiard table and mapping that was done 10 years ago, 50 years ago, at the time was done at the limits of the accuracy of the technology available at the time. So a slight error in any surveying and mapping done in the, in the, in the past can have a significant difference on planning and the like because of the, the, the slight slope of our parishes. Because we're so flat. And uh, the only way to go from one data to another is to either have reference points that you can go to in, in one datum and convert to the other, or to have a conversion mechanism program or something like that. You're not going to have many NGVD 29 marks that you can trust. The only thing you're left with is a conversion program. NGVD 29 does not define a level surface either. It does not define a surface that water won't flow on it. It's a, it's a biased datum. Uh, the only way to perform a survey now would be to do it in the newer datum, NAVD 88, then do a blanket conversion of all your data back to whatever datum you want in GV 29. 
there will be a conversion from the new vertical date, 2022, back to NAVD 88. And the only conversion that I know of is work time to get back to NGVD 29. That's all we have, except for marks <coughs> in the ground that are NGVD 29 have those values also. And how much do you trust them? I wouldn't even trust them for NAVD 88. No, it, so the vertical movement is so much that it destroys it destroys any capability of translation. Because you're trying to translate to something that's moved already. See what yeah. I'm trying to say? Right. So it's not a valid datum translation because you don't have where that old datum was. So in the end, we can't find, especially in a place with dynamic subsidence like we have, we can't find 29. No, it's gone. It's right. gone. It's long and gone. Right. Forget about it. We don't know where we it is. We can pretend for official purposes to come up with a number. And that's about it. Yeah, but it's, yeah. it's a bureaucratic lot. You had a question, sir? I have a question. Yep. I, I wear, I'm in Lake Charles area. Uh, the, the few uh, benchmarks that are on the uh, NGS website that are, uh, I'm going to call them validated, uh, I'm having more and more difficulty getting uh, those to correlate to my, uh, 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 you know, my GPS. Some of them are good. Some of them are getting loud. Mm -hmm. Where are they? Uh, Will those ever reach out, or do you just take something? I wouldn't use them. Yeah. You, you get camera fetch? Lake Charles. Lake Charles. Wouldn't use them. Oh, no. Don't even. Even though they're, even though they're still following? Speak to They say 2009.55 epic. Yeah. 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 Yeah
model for a geoid uh, separation from the ellipsoid down to the data. That's uh, not that's not an epoch. Equal potential data. Right. Is, is there some point in time that MBS says, okay, this is a yeah. Yeah. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Right. And, and X stands for what? I don't know. Probably beta. I think it means don't use it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have an idea when 410B is going to be out of beta? I have no idea. But, 2022. But, you know. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't know that the, I don't know that the plan is to publish an interim uh, gravity based geo. That's the last thing I heard was that they, they, wouldn't, they might publish another hybrid geo now in 2022, but they probably would not publish a complete gravity-based geo. That's probably why they're uh, initiating us with right. beta versions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I th and, and I think it's, it may be like some of the other things. The beta ver versions will be usable. But, but you have to know what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. I think you were first. Yes, ma'am. Well, I've done a lot, but... Um, Question, I guess, for each of you is, if the state of Louisiana thought it could do a better job of developing the flood insurance rate map and regulatory map, what entity within the state do you think would have that capability? Would you trust to incorporate all the right stuff? Society of Surveyors, Society of Engineers. Yes. Yeah. C4G. Yeah, C4G. I, I think they don't have G working with CPRA would probably be my guess. Does the does the society have a political action committee? We have a uh, the equivalent. We don't have an actual PAC, oh, okay. but yes. That, the, it, I know in Florida, the, the society has a political action committee that uh, takes care of things. Saving my job is one of them. Um, but. Um, I think the place to start is, is to get some influence, to get some, you know, to explain to the politicians what's going on and why this, um, a new rate map would, if you can get the credits, if you can convince FEMA to give you the credits, would help all the citizens in the, in the state to get lower flood rates. And, and those are the kinds of things that impress politicians. They need to, um, how many, it's, how many votes can I get? Yeah. Is what they're looking for. I, I see. And, I see. And, Go ahead. Um, so if, if it's going to help the citizens and they can say we helped the citizens, we got the rates lower, then so it's going to take some initial action, and and then um, obviously I, I you need experts to do the calculations and you need other people to do the lidar or however else you're going to be able to. The, and the other consideration you're going to have to have is if you do an accurate flood hazard rating map, you may discover that the hazards are much more pronounced than you think. And it will take a bigger effort in order to build structures that are uh, safer or, or, or reduce the risk. Sometimes the truth hurts. And, uh, and I have my suspicion that sometimes when FEMA put out their maps, they took a look at what it did to the community as far as cost goes, and they put their thumb on the scale. They're mm -hmm. saying if, if to, to kind of soften the blow a little bit. Mm -hmm. That's just about my suspicion, but I'm a cynical kind of guy. I'm gonna follow up on what uh, Dave Newcomer was saying. I think with some self-interest involved that the technical aspects of developing geoid, uh, uh, a pseudo-geoid and the such, lies within the realm of what C4G can handle. The ability to connect across the state with politicians and the community itself, LSPS uh, probably has the best uh, connections to do that. Someone has to take it under his, uh, into his vest as his, his charge to coordinate this. It's, it's not the sort of thing that happens, it's not a snowball that starts rolling. It's gonna take a, Take a leader. Uh, and and yes. Uh, to add to what you're saying, to answer, follow up on her question there about uh, who would take charge of that. Personally, I think it, it'd be cooperation with your federal and state agencies, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, USDA, 
P, uh, CPRA, LSPS, and C4G, I think all of these agencies working together, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in cooperation to, you know, come up with uh, solutions to that sure. problem. We'll get them all together, we'll have a whole alphabet soon. There yeah. you go. Maurice. Uh, we had talked about this briefly with a couple of members of the panel during the break, but uh, I wanted to ask for any comment uh, based on our current world political situation about using, or uh, continuing to use in the collection of PRS data, continuing to use the GLONASS system. Anybody want to touch that one? Highway Department, I guarantee you that. We don't use it at the Highway Department. Uh, we, it's, it's very unreliable. I mean, it, it wasn't long ago, like within the last year, there was an article on one of these National American surveyors about how unreliable it was, and don't, I wouldn't sign my name behind it. Uh, it's useful if you're in an urban canyon to speed up initialization. Other than that, for all intents and purposes, it's useless. I found that it's, it's real uh, benefit to us, because the GPS is so good, uh, is when we can't get enough GPS. So sometimes under canopy, sometimes in Urban Canyon, when we know our result is not going to be as good as we'd like it to be, we would, the three categories I had, when we want to try to see if we can get it to be good enough, uh, that's when it's most appropriate. If you're doing mapping, to a couple of feet or something like that. Uh, GLONASS, it's probably safe to leave it turned on most of the time. You're probably not, in my opinion, uh, with corrections, you're probably not going to see this difference we're talking about. But if you care about the vertical, you must be interested in the tiny stuff because the vertical is so hard to get with GPS. The, the GPS uh, system modern GPS satellites have the capability of, of turning coverage off to areas. Yes. I don't know if GLONASS has that capability or not. If they don't have the capability, I wouldn't expect them to turn it off or deny service. Now, the thing that might happen is the update information they send up to the satellites, you know, if they stop doing that to a certain precision, then your, your results then would degrade. I would say, you know, again, the consensus is to use it when you need more satellites to get an answer. But don't use it if you have enough GPS coverage. Use redundancy to check yourself. The, the recommendation we've always used is seven GPS satellites to use a real-time network. If you have seven GPS satellites, you don't need anything else. You have enough. Sometimes the application might start with seven, but as soon as you right. drive past it. Right. Uh, you have seven along. And that's when GLONASS would help. And it's a question of having slightly degraded data or no data at all. Right. And, 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 that, and that, that line. That's driven by the application. What am I using this information for? I've got time for about maybe two quick questions or one long one. And John's got his hand up in the back. Question. I just want to say something in support of GRI 12 because we love it, Alexandria. Okay, we're getting dead on to about a centimeter and a half. <laughs> you hear that, That's Dave? Great. I hear that. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that means we have time for another one. Connie. <laughs> Is he that close? You did say earlier that you can measure very precisely the difference in the soil height at any point over time by making repeat observations, right? By making repeat observations. Yeah, if I come Multiple. to this point today and I come back here again a year from now, we can, the difference in ellipsoid. Oh, oh. How much that point move during that period? I would think so. Don't do you agree with that? I do. Yeah. I, I wanted to preface my question. Okay. I wanted to make sure I understood that correctly. I would think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's suspend reality for a second. I know the cost of doing a first order level, I mean, that's cost prohibitive. But if we had an accurate altimetric height on that station, and then we monitored over time with the soil height differences, what if we then be able to redefine its altimetric yeah. height yep. at each one of those epic measurements? As far as I'm concerned, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, it's the same point. You know how much it's subsided, or maybe even, you know, come up a little bit or something. I don't know why things go like this, but. It, maybe a fluid withdrawal and infusion, I don't know. But uh, yeah, I mean, to me, at a point, ellipsoid height change 
uh, equals orthometric height change. At a point. At a point. I would, uh, I would like to add to that one. Yeah, I mean with the same model, right? <laughs> same model. We're in terms of golf head network, so we can, conceptually we should be able to do this for even passive marks that are not part of the continuous by operation reference. I would yeah. let, let me enter in a, 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 it acts like a fiducial station. Right. One one caveat. As the mark or whatever is causing it to move up or down moves, that in part represents the mass that is creating the gravity that we're trying to measure the differences in to get our orthometric heights. And so after some point, the magnitude is enough so that the difference in yeah. ellipsoid height does not equal the change in orthometric Roman, height. Dr. Roman says 10 centimeters change in gravity, uh, in um, ellipsoid, in subsidence or whatever. 10, 10 centimeters equals a one centimeter change in the geoid. So, so if you have 10 gravity. centimeters subsidence, it changes the geoid one centimeter. Okay. Yeah. okay. Now, now one other thing, which you were you were asking about, and that is. If you make an observation at a mark today and you get a value of the ellipsoid height, you have observed the ellipsoid height within a certain envelope of error. It's not perfection. Correct. You have a number plus or minus something. Correct. You come back at a later date and do another observation. You get a slightly different number. It has an envelope of error also. So from year to year, you may see a trend, but you don't have anything that you can go to the bank with because you are uh, stacking envelope of error on top of envelope of error. So normally, we expect that it's going to take observations over a period of years before we can be certain that we're actually seeing movement beyond white noise. So, so Dr. Mooney, my voluntary voice for asking that question is, we have, over the past 10 or so years, made, we've had multiple static campaigns, right, to, to help build the various geoid models and create these efforts of NADD engagement. It seems reasonable to me that we have this, these GPS observations on what we call passive marks. Yes. So, so we should be able to use that data, that legacy data, and data moving forward to come up with, in my opinion, better subsidence rates than we are coming up with yes. by creating new geoid models. And we have some spaces that in a five year span, the difference in NADD elevation or one foot lower. Now, I understand we're subsiding, I just have a hard time believing that a particular point has moved down to a foot in five years. That probably an artifact of the fact that the first time we put the new NADDA elevation on it, we were probably wrong. The, the most recent one may be the most accurate. It's just hard to say that in that five years, that point moved down a foot. It That's correct. In some location certain. Yeah, now, so like uh, Fort Jackson. Fort Jackson NGS went down there um, at one point. I'm trying to remember now, it was the early 1980s. And then uh, they came back in the early 1990s. And uh, Fort Jackson had subsided a foot and a half. Well, my, my reason for asking the question is there are some stations that are part of uh, the 2009.55 publication that we have occupied in the past. The delta is just about height on those stations, on the published data sheets, on one of them in particular is about three centimeters. Uh, the difference in its orthometric height is a foot, so three decimeters. You know, so I, for some reason, I, it just doesn't correlate in my brain. If we can measure its movement using different, different differential and the heights over time, there should be at least some correlation between the orthometric height changes and the lift height changes. That's the great. fact that there aren't is... I'm going to interrupt you, Connie, because we've run out of time. And... Uh, I wanted to applaud you for being a very good audience and coming out. Thank, personally, the contributions of our panel. And then I'll ask Dr. Kent if there's uh, anything he has to add. I appreciate everybody coming out.
All of this was made possible through an NGS grant, but also because you're here, because we're here to, to support you. So all the work that Randy has done, Larry, Cliff, and Tony, is all because we're here to support you, and I appreciate you coming out from the show. And the biggest validation to us and to NGS and others who help us put this together is the fact that this room was full and the fact that we had some people watching this as it streamed live also. So thank you and stay in touch. We